morning, everyone, or afternoon, I should rather say. We're getting ahead of ourselves. Um, my name is Liz Bartolomeo, and I'm the media director here at the Sunlight Foundation. Uh, today we have um, a pretty special thing for everyone who's joining our call, and that is we're doing a special presentation of learning how to use our APIs in the newsroom. Over the past year, the Sunlight Foundation has really built up um, our API community, our application program interfaces. And today we have um, some of our software and web, web developers on hand to help everyone get to know our APIs a little more, um, share some examples of how other media organizations have used them over the past year or so, as well as answering your questions and get your ideas on how you can really use um, these great free offerings from the Sunlight Foundation. Um, so thank you for being here today. Uh, again, if you're on the call, please press star six to mute your, mute your phone. At the end, we will have a Q&A, um, but if something comes up or you're going to have to step off the call early, please use the chat function um, on the left-hand side of your screen. You can ask us questions. Um, all of our speakers will be on hand to answer your questions. So um, before we begin the call, or hopefully everyone has already, um, we encourage everyone to please visit um, sunlightfoundation.com slash API to register for a free API key. It's painless. It takes about five seconds. All you need is an email address. And this, once you register, you'll be able to access everything that we are talking about today. Um, We'll do more, brief, more introductions once everyone's started, but I want to uh, introduce some of the people you're going to hear on the call today. We have Amy Nye, who's our Partnerships Manager, Dan Drinkard, uh, Bob Vogel, Bob, excuse me, Drew Vogel, Bob Lannon, Jacob Fenton, and James Turk are all our developers and engineers here on staff. Um, so this is a good, this is the people you'll be hearing from. They have a lot of great expertise. We might get a little technical here. So if you know, something is mentioned and you don't really understand, please ask us a question about it. Um, and we really are, we provide a lot of great opportunities for you to get to learn how to code a little better too. Um, in fact, we have a partnership with Code Academy. Uh, there's a, some great tutorials on there for free to get to learn of how you can get to know these APIs if you're learning to um, write code and are, whether you're a beginner level or a little more intermediate level. Um, before we really get started, I also want to sort of give everyone a little taste of who actually uses our APIs. So what you see on your screen now are four examples of some media outlets that have used our APIs that we're going to be talking about today. Um, the website Real Clear Politics uses our Congress API in their Congressional Bill Tracker. Um, it allows users to follow members of Congress and get email updates on their activities. So when you visit Real Clear Politics, um, their Congressional Bill Tracker, it will identify where you're from uh, using a geolocation feature, uh, and it will pull up information such as who's your representative in Congress, their, um, their district map, and it's a really great tool they're providing for their website visitors. Um, the, the website MinPost, MinPost.com, has created a Minnesota Legislative Bill Tracker for the past two years, actually, using our Open States API. It's a really great interactive feature that tracks the most important bills in the uh, Minnesota Legislature. So I encourage people to check it out. It has some really um, exciting visuals as well. Uh, back in May of 2012, NPR covered um, Sunlight's congressional uh, speech level analysis, where we gave members of Congress a letter grade uh, as in like school letter grade, 10th grade, 12th grade, um, determining on what, lev what level of speech they use in their uh, official speeches in the congressional record. And that analysis used our Capital Words API and the data that site provides. Um, also this past year, the Daily Beast uh, used our, both our Congress and Influence Explorer APIs, and they created a tool that helped uh, members of the public uh, see a, get a better sense of where their member of Congress stands on gun control issues. Um, and they used a lot of also other data sources for that interactive site, so be sure to check out the URL that's on your screen. Um, and a lot of this is possible is because Sunlight this year built an API community page. And I'm going to turn it over to Amy Nye to talk about that a little more. Great. Thanks, Liz. Um, so 
it's great that we have uh, an API page uh, for Sunlight Foundation, but it's also it's more than just us providing the data and making it public available, but it's also about the users themselves. It's about the technologists, it's about the journalists, it's about the activists who are using this data in creative ways that we actually have, have never could even imagine uh, people would use it for. So um, there are lots of different things that are on the sunlightfoundation.com API page, uh, including this community section. Um, and also we have a list of the different um, APIs that are available, and libraries and whatnot. But part of the best way to illustrate that is just to show you what the page looks like. So I'm going to share my desktop right now. So sunlightfoundation.com slash API, very easy to remember. And here you will see the number of the different data services that we have. And our developers will walk you through um, each of them and show you how to try the API as well. Um, but as Liz was saying, it's more than just the data sources. It's also about this community. Uh, so here on this uh, tab here, the community tab, when you click on that, you can see uh, a number of different projects that we're highlighting here, uh, data-focused projects. And the idea is that you know it's not just us that are in the space of using data and making uh, different resources publicly available, but there are lots of people who are doing this in the space that we can all share and often learn from. So there are a number of projects here. They're categorized in three ways. One is by whether a project needs technical help, uh, whether, uh, two, whether it needs non-technical help, because I think there are lots of different ways that non-technologists can definitely get involved and uh, help with um, and volunteer uh, with some of these projects. And lastly, it's projects to inspire. So great projects that are open source, that have their code up online on GitHub, and that other people can just take and just apply in a different community. So there are a number of different resources here, and I really encourage you um, to take a look at them, because there are a lot of different interesting ones, and you can also sort them easily uh, by just clicking on what, what you're interested in. Let's say you're only interested in projects that are inspirational. And then, of course, a lot of you are in the newsrooms, and you are working on the projects that need help uh, and, and need the amateur journalists uh, or the bloggers um, who are in the communities. And if you have those type of projects, feel free to submit them here. And we, this is just think of this as a platform for you to share the work that you're doing and to recruit volunteers and rep um, other reporters as well. Um, and another feature that we have here in the API page um, are the, uh, is the API gallery. And this is a little bit of uh, what Liz was talking about uh, before in terms of highlighting the different projects that use the data that we make available. Uh, some of the ones that she mentioned are here, uh, the MinPost one as well. So you can just uh, find a little bit more about the different projects. It also lists the APIs, uh, some of the APIs that they're using, um, and they'll link directly to um, those sites. And then lastly, I want to highlight here is that the, our API is in use. As I was saying earlier, it's really about the community that we are in. It's not just about us making this data available, but it's about other people using that. Uh, so these are so some stats, and these are live stats on uh, how many API keys um, that people have signed up for to date, the average daily API calls, and then additionally, the total. And we're serving um, over, is that a billion? That is, over a billion API uh, calls served. So there is a number of resources here in um, the Sunlight Foundation slash API page, and I really just encourage you to um, explore these resources. Thanks, Amy. And you can see right here, again, another snapshot of our over 1.1 billion API calls served over the past two years. We rank up there, you know, like the signs on McDonald's. Um, and it's through these following six APIs is where we're able to get all these great calls um, and keys made to date. So I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dan Drinkard to talk about our, um, who's actually going to be who's joining us remotely, so you're going to hear him on the phone, uh, talking about our Capital Words API. Hey, guys. Can everybody hear me? Yep. Awesome. All right. So I'm Dan Drinkard. I'm the maintainer of CapitalWords.org. Uh, and what that is is um, an ngram viewer for the congressional record. Uh, what that means is that every day uh, we download the congressional record and break it up into uh, tokens, which are uh, individual words or parts of words, uh, and we track popularity of the uh, the top phrases from one to five words long uh, 
since uh, 1996. Um, so, you know, down here you can see uh, a histogram of um, war versus peace uh, and the relative popularity of each uh, overall all, all time that we have recorded. Um, we make this uh, data available on this website, capitalwords.org, but also uh, via a couple of API endpoints. Um, and so if you go to sunlightfoundation.com slash API, uh, you'll see it's the first one listed. Um, and the documentation you can get to by clicking this link right here. Uh, and that takes you to a page that looks, well, like this. Um, and so what you'll see here on the left, we have uh, four different methods, phrase time series, top phrases by entity, top entities by phrase, and text search. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and go over those now. Um, if you guys have uh, an API key registered, you can, you can go to tryit.sunlightfoundation.com slash capital words and put in your key. Um, and you can play along with me if you like. Uh, so the first one is phrase time series. Uh, this is for drawing a histogram sort of like this one here. Um, it gets the popularity of a word uh, over each point in time uh, that we have available. Um, so Sunlight this morning uh, published uh, a series on guns in Sandy Hook one year later. So let's look at the popularity of guns over time. So if I just type in guns here, um, that's really all I have to do. Right now we're going to get a, a year by year uh, result set. And I can just hit this button down here. Uh, and you'll see um, a total number of utterances of the word guns um, in each year. Uh, it's a lot. But we can go further and break that down uh, and filter it more uh, by using any of these available, uh, available fields. And what you'll see down below here um, is the actual URL that gets generated by this form. So um, if you want to see uh, just what's been talked about in DC, you can do that too. Um, and it's going to be a smaller number. Uh, we can break that down uh, to by date. Um, and so on and so forth. Uh, we have a, a percentage as well in the result set. Um, what this represents is uh, the percentage of all words spoken on this day that were the word gun. Um, so that's the date's endpoint. Um, next we have top phrases by entity. What this means, um, is that say for a given legislator or for a state you want to find out what the top words are that they've said. So uh, to use this endpoint you have to choose an entity type and an entity value. Uh, but those are the only required uh, fields. So let's actually look at a particular state. So let's see what's popular in Alaska. I'll type in AK for my state. We use two, uh, two digit postal abbreviation. Uh, hit go. And we can see the top words for Alaska. These you can get an arbitrary number, I think up to like a thousand or something like that. Uh, but you can determine how many you want per page uh, and how you want to sort them. So um, these are pre-calculated and run about once every week, whereas the the date uh, time series endpoint is going to hit our search backend directly. Uh, these are kind of expensive queries, so just keep in mind that they may not be changing in real time. Uh, it's going to be about every week that you'll see them change. Um, the next endpoint is top entities by phrase, which is sort of the reverse of that. So if you have a word that, or uh, a set of words that you're curious about, you can see who or, or what state or, or what month used the, those words the most. Uh, so we'll, we'll do the same thing with guns again. Um, choose legislator as our entity, guns as our phrase. Maybe we're only interested in people who have said it 10 or more times. We'll look at the first page, 50 per page, and we're going to sort by the number of times that they've said it. So we'll go ahead and hit go here. And we have our results. Uh, what you have here are a count, which is the number of times it was said, and then the by a guide ID of the legislator. Uh, you can look these up using um, bioguide.congress.gov, I believe, is the website. Yep. So. Um, this doesn't provide you with a form to search, but uh, say you just choose a person here, um, and you'll see we have this URL with the index right here, and that's actually the BioGuide ID. So uh, if you bookmark this URL, and I'll post it into the chat uh, in a minute, um, you can get those and, and reverse look them up. 
So uh, that is top entities by phrase. Uh, and last, the most I, I think interesting endpoint here, the one that I use the most, is the full text search. Um, so this is for searching text throughout the entire congressional record. Uh, it's the same thing as if you were to go to capitalwords.org and type in a word here, only you're going to get a lot more data back. Uh, here we only show you the most recent you know, dozen or so results. Uh, and there's no way to paginate through it. So uh, if you really want to do real digging, you need to use the API. Um, so we'll do the same thing again here. Um, and you'll see that there are four 1,914 documents that match um, the word guns. And that's not actual utterances of the word guns, that's speeches that contain the word. So uh, there are a lot more utterances, obviously. Um, you can do some more advanced stuff with uh, this endpoint than with a lot of the others. Um, and actually, I'm going to show you that in a minute. Uh, so, but one thing that you can do is make sure that you're only seeing uh, documents that match uh, that were spoken by a person. Um, there's a lot of uh, text that's inserted into the record uh, and, and interjections from the recorder and that sort of thing that can't be cleanly attributed back to a person. So uh, you can use solar query syntax to ask for a range of, of person IDs. Uh, and I'll also post a link to that. Um, there's a good resource here uh, about how to had a query with solar and I'll post that as well. But we can filter this um, and that's going to make sure that we're only getting results back that have uh, a person associated with them. So you can see here Mr. Royce, uh, so on and so forth. All of these are going to have uh, a person specifically associated with them. So um, the last thing that I want to go over uh, is this, there's an undocumented parameter for this one that lets you do those types of filters on the, the phrase as well. So um, using this Q parameter uh, rather than text, you can get into solar stuff. I'm put that up there. So uh, if you guys can see this, what we have here is gun star or shoot star in parentheses. Uh, and that will match uh, partial words that start with gun or shoot. Uh, and it will give you both of them. So um, this is uh, access to a much more powerful set of searches than would normally be available through the front end of the website or even just through uh, the, the basic text and title um, arguments for this API. So this is a, a really powerful thing um, that you can use. So if I can figure out how to quit screen sharing, I will ask if there are questions. So yeah, I think we're back. So um, quickly, I guess we've probably got to move on. But does anybody have any questions about that? Yeah, I, someone just asked if we can post the links that we use. So yeah, um, absolutely. Dan, I, I think will. Dan, if you can use the chat function, uh, mm -hmm. you can share some of those links. And if you want to share your email address too, uh, just let everyone know. We'll make. All of our, we'll make all of our stuff available. I think that, that was a really great resource and probably see some of this stuff keep coming up as uh, we go through the other ones. Um, and we'll be, again, we'll be archiving this uh, webinar and sharing all the information you're seeing on screen as well as the screen shares our presenters are showing. So we'll be emailing that out afterwards. Uh, moving on, we're going to be looking now at our Congress API version 3. And I'm going to throw that over to Drew Vogel. Uh, to walk us through that. All right, thank you. Um, enable desktop sharing here. All right, so here we'll uh, come back to our uh, API portal page. Uh, this page will probably become more and more familiar to as the webinar goes on. Uh, we're going to go over the Capital Words API here. Uh, the Congress, Congress. <laughs> Congress API here. Uh, the Documentation is uh, going to be very valuable to you here because Congress API covers way more than we can cover in a, a short segment in a webinar. Um, you can use the uh, Query Builder with this API just like most of our others. So if I put in an API key here and put in a 
zip code into this legislator's locate field, uh, we can do the same uh, feature that Liz mentioned Real Clear Politics does. This is the API endpoint that they use behind the scenes. Uh, they do it with latitude and longitude, but since I can't recall my current latitude and longitude right now, I'm just going to use my home zip code. Uh, and you'll see that uh, that's in DC, and Eleanor Holmes Norton is my uh, representative, my delegate. Uh, it should work for most zip codes. Zip codes, they're a little less reliable than latitude and longitude just because of uh, discrepancies and boundaries between congressional districts and zip codes. Uh, if we peek back at the uh, Congress API documentation, uh, the, every URL that the API uses has the form that's highlighted here in blue. Uh, after that, we're going to be putting one of these methods. Uh, the Congress API has quite a few methods, but we're just going to concentrate on a few here, legislators, bills, and votes. Uh, so if we look at the legislators tab, you can see it's uh, Congress api.sunlightfoundation.com slash legislators. I've added our uh, testing uh, API key here, Webinar 2013, which uh, uh, you'll have to sign up for your own API key. That mm -hmm. API key will be disabled after the webinar here. Uh, but as I scroll here through the results here, you can see that these are all uh, little blobs of information that represent members of Congress. If we scroll all the way down to the bottom, you'll see there's uh, pagination information. You only ever get 20 results at a time here. Uh, but there's 538, that's uh, one for every member of Congress, plus a few delegates and so forth. Uh, if we start adding fields to the end of this URL here, we can filter the results. So uh, if I am covering John Boehner, for instance, and I'm over here at uh, Open Secrets, I can uh, select his CRP, I, Open Secrets ID, out of my address bar. I can go back over to our API. I can put in a field filter here, CRP I underscore ID, and this will get me John Boehner's information. So if you already have a database of, of legislators and you've been keen off of something like uh, CRP, uh, those IDs will work for API as well. You'll see a lot of different IDs. Uh, we try to interoperate with everybody, uh, GovTrack, the ICPSR IDs, so forth. Uh, the if you don't know what specific legislator you're looking for, though, and you just want to find legislators of a certain type, there are many uh, other query parameters that you can add. One of the more interesting ones will, will be start date. So the current term started uh, January 3rd, 2013. So if we put in that the term, the legislator's term start date is greater than or equal to 2013, January 4th, we'll get all the members of Congress who uh, came into office for some reason other than being elected, which, of which there was six. Uh, that, that will only, of course, be, uh, on, only reflect members of Congress who are actual members of Congress, not people who have you know, been elected but not yet seated and so forth. Uh, you won't get preliminary results based on interim elections. Uh, so that's uh, just a couple of the ways that you can look at legislators through API. Uh, now we'll take a look at bills. Much like the legislators API endpoint listed, by default listed all of the legislators, uh, the bills endpoint by default lists all of the bills. So you can see down at the bottom here, there's 32,000 bills in the uh, uh, data set. So we definitely do not want to look at all 32,000. Uh, one of the more useful uh, filters you'll find on here is something called uh, history.active. And this is a filter that uh, we use in a lot of our work where we want to discard all of the bills that really aren't going to go anywhere. They've just been introduced for, you know, some symbolic reason. Uh, it, so bills that are simply introduced and then referred to a committee uh, will be filtered out if you use history.active equals true. That can be helpful for doing pretty much any type of analysis where you're only interested in viable bills. Uh, that brings our results set here down to 7,000 bills. You can see that's uh, going to reduce the problem space for you by quite a bit. Uh, so if you have a very specific beat that you're covering, like a uh, uh, certain committee, we can pull out the bills that are referred to a certain committee or set of committees. So if I say uh, committee IDs equals anything that you would normally find on Thomas, so SSAP is the um, uh, Senate Appropriations Committee. Uh, here we can get just the, 
the bills that are referred to that committee. You can, I don't know if you can see the uh, highlight background here. Um, so if you've uh, got a beat that covers all of Congress, you can find uh, entire sets of bills to analyze or you can uh, zoom right down to uh, very low levels. Uh, one of the other features that you'll, I'm sure everybody will find useful, uh, no matter what you cover, is the bill search field. Uh, if you add a query parameter here named query, uh, if we search for, say, healthcare, uh, this will this will find all bills that have healthcare in the bill text somewhere or in a summary information. And if we say highlight equals true, uh, then in our little in our results here in the text, you'll see uh, little M tags here. So that if you have a, a use where you just want to search bill text and then spit the results out to your website and they're already highlighted for you, that's the feature you're looking for. Uh, so, if you are interested in a specific bill that you know is coming up for a vote, you can then go to the votes endpoint. Uh, by default, again, it will return you all votes uh, that are going on. Uh, and so, if we if we add a query parameter for the current day, uh, we can say voted at equals. 13, 12, I think it's the ninth today. Uh, and so they haven't voted on anything um, yet. Uh, let's go back to the beginning of the month. Yeah, it looks like not many recently. Although, no, I'm just close to doing something wrong. <laughs> Well, there's plenty of other uh, ways to query the endpoint. Uh, we'll move on to another one. Uh, if you <coughs> are once again covering uh, John Boehner <laughs> um, and you want to just find all the votes where he voted a certain way, you can say, uh, or all, just all the bills that he voted on. If you say uh, voter IDs and then his BioGuide ID, which is B0005895, uh, BioGuide IDs, Dan showed you with the Capital Words API. Um, you can go to BioGuide.Congress.gov, uh, I believe, to look those up. Um, I just happen to know John Boehner's, um, so I use it for less testing purposes. Uh, this query, though, will tell us. Yeah, there's something wrong with this, too. There you go. Exists, not exist. Uh, this will just return a list of all of the bills where John Boehner voted. Uh, so that's a, a good starting point if you want to uh, look at his activity in Congress. So if we want to uh, figure out, say, uh, bills where uh, John Boehner voted and the, the votes had a bipartisan outcome, we can add uh, something like breakdown, uh, breakdown .total yeah. Uh, 280 votes or more. So this would give you a pretty um, pretty rough filter on bipartisan votes where John Boehner voted, and then you can look at the results to see how he voted either way. Uh, so uh, those are the uh, legislators' bills and votes endpoints. Uh, there's quite a few other endpoints, so I would encourage you to look at the documentation. Uh, you'll probably find floor updates and upcoming bills to be especially useful. Those will cover uh, the here and now um, with results similar to what you saw in the other end. Well, I'm going to actually hold it on the screen for a minute, uh, not Influence Explorer, just so people can sort of see the rundown of everything from our uh, Congress API. Also, just let people know on these slides, we will share information on what, on what APIs our sites are covering as well. So I'm going to turn it over to Bob Lannon right now uh, to take a look now. We looked at sort of how members, their speeches in Congress and information about how they vote and the bills they sponsor, and now we're turning to our Influence Explorer API which allows you to see how they're raising money and, and lobbying records. Give this a second to show up. <clears throat> Hi, uh, my name is Bob Lennon. I'm, the, uh, I'm on the Influence Explorer team. <clears throat> uh, our InfluenceExplorer.com is dedicated to uh, having an entity-based uh, lookup across all of the different streams 
of data that we have about entities who engage in government influence at some level. So uh, when you go to influenceexplorer.com, um, you actually see our APIs in action all of the time. The public site for Influence Explorer is the number one client for the Influence Explorer API. Um, when, so for instance, when we go, when we look at people, uh, this is an API call that calls the top 50 um, uh, uh, individuals from, in this case, the 2012 race, uh, sorted by their uh, total campaign uh, finance contributions. Um, going on a single person's page, uh, all of the data visualizations, charts, graphs um, that we show are also uh, visualizations of results from the Influence Explorer API. Uh, so let's look at uh, which kinds of things you can uh, find uh, from uh, the API. <clears throat> First of all, the most important type of call, uh, types of calls are the entity lookups. So whenever you want information about an entity tracked from Influence Explorer, you're going to need their uh, universal identifier. So we have our own uh, very long uh, identifiers uh, for, for all the entities that we store in Influence Explorer. The three entity lookups that we have are, uh, first of all, the entities.json endpoint, which let you do, um, which lets you do string searching, much like you would through the search box on the front page of Influence Explorer. And, um, and we also allow uh, lookup by identifier. So if you have another identifier for the entity that you'd like to look up, like maybe, maybe their BioGuide ID, maybe the ID that you get through opensecrets.org uh, from the Center for Responsive Politics, or followthemoney.org uh, uh, from uh, the National Institute for Money and State Politics. Uh, we uh, allow identifier crosswalk lookup uh, for those. Uh, third, you can look through the, um, once you have uh, the identifier for, for some entity, the Influence Explorer identifier that is, uh, you can get back all of the metadata that we have on that entity, which will give you all of the other identifiers we have for them, as well as some summary data for their different behaviors uh, during each cycle, and, the, and if a politician, their sort of history of uh, uh, occupying different offices. So let's do some examples of these, just because we're going to need these for most, uh, for most uh, queries that a, that a researcher is using. Um, they'll have to go through a two-step process. First is to obtain the, the IE ID, um, and uh, you can use that through any of the me methods that I just mentioned. And the second is to submit an API call using that identifier to find out things like their most popular contributors or uh, group by industry, or their most, uh, you know, their most popular, uh, 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 the most popular um, lobbying firms who have, uh, who have, who they've hired. Uh, so let's start with a really simple example. Um, I'm again looking, I'm, I'm again following from the API uh, community page. I'm clicking on the Influence Explorer API, try the API button. And we are looking first at, say, an entity lookup. Say I don't know uh, any kind of identifiers for the person that I'm looking for, and I'd just like to know what the system has. So let's search the string Obama. and let it know that we're looking for a politician. We'll get back uh, this response body, which you'll notice there are two entries for Barack Obama. One is, uh, one is his time as the, at the federal level as the president, uh, which you can see through the seat value. And another is his time as uh, at the state level, which is current, which was, you know, the most recent was in the upper chamber. So this, um, but most importantly, what we get here is the ID. Right down here in this field, the ID is the identifier that Influence Explorer uses to speak about this uh, uh, person. So if we copy that, we can start using it in other, uh, in other lookups. So. For instance, if we wanted to get an overview of that entity, we could put in his identifier and put in a cycle, and we would get all we would get some summary information 
for Barack Obama over um, actually all cycles. So uh, here you're seeing different totals for all the different data sets that we maintain. Um, probably some of the most uh, interesting ones for a politician are those around, um, are those of the politician as recipient. So here we have uh, Barack Obama taking in uh, 31, 314 million dollars, uh, something like that. So um, <clears throat> the, uh, uh, as you go down past all of those aggregate amounts, you'll also see some external identifiers. Now, these are namespaced, which means that we have identifiers that, uh, you know, are associated with all different outside industry, outside organizations, uh, and we, so whenever we give you an identifier, we tell you who it's associated with and what the identifier is. So, first of all, we have the, C, the Center for Responsive Politics, that's opensecrets.org, identifies him as N00009638. Um, the FEC thinks of him has three different identifiers for him. One for his, uh, one as a, a senatorial candidate, one as a House candidate, one as a president. Um, the uh, other metadata that we share, especially, uh, particularly in the case for, of uh, politicians, are their history um, in different offices. So you can get an idea of, uh, of their history. We also have some uh, biographical information, uh, the current seat held, um, and, um, and any links, in this case, Barack Obama has also a state politician en entity, so we're going to give you a link to that one, and this is another Influence Explorer ID where you can get uh, uh, information about contributions that he received while running for state office. Um, <clears throat> the, finally, we have a, a qu for many uh, politicians, uh, we have a, a URL to their uh, to a photo that uh, that is usually associated with the Wikipedia page, and um, their bio guide ID um, and the, the URL for their biography. Um, going back a step, if we were going to let's say we have uh, let's say we have an ID from another site, we can use the ID lookup field here to uh, to look up that person specifically. Uh, and, and, and get some more targeted search. This is if you're going to automate the lookup. You don't, you know, as you saw when I did the string match uh, search through the entities endpoint, I got multiple results. And multiple results is not fun for something that you want to run on its own. So if you were writing an automated system, you might want to start from some kind of ID. Um, so let's say, let's go to, um, I'm looking here at the United States repo which is something that some Sunlighters have contributed to, and it happens to be one place where you can find very good identifiers for different members of Congress. So if I look at the legislator's current file, uh, I see uh, the first entry uh, for no particular reason is Sherrod Brown, uh, the bi uh, whose BioGuide ID is B000944. <clears throat> and my computer's going to die. Okay. Uh, so here I could give the BioGuide ID to this endpoint, try it, and get back that same, get back the, um, the identifier for uh, uh, Sherrod Brown. Uh, again, giving that identifier back to the entity overview, I would get all the same information that we just looked at for Barack Obama. I would get that for Sherrod Brown. Um, covering a lot of ground all at once, I, I, I realize, but... Um, I'm just going to move on to the other kinds of search methods that we have. Um, the next step up will probably be the, uh, the aggregate methods for each type of entity. We have, um, we have four entity types in Influence Explorer. Uh, the first is the politician. The second is the individual. Individuals are any uh, non-associated individual who is, um, who is uh, making uh, who is involved in government influence in some way. So that could be uh, a lobbyist, that could be a campaign con contributor, uh, that could be a bundler, that could be um, the executive of a company. So uh, the next type is an organization. Organization is also sort of a broad category, but it includes uh, some um, campaign finance committees, it includes private organizations, uh, it also includes um, the uh, uh, for-profit for organizations and 
um, and uh, ideological groups uh, like the NRA or the uh, AARP. So uh, finally, the last type is industry, and this, these industries correspond to the Center for Responsive Politics uh, industry coding. Uh, if you're not familiar with these, the Center for Responsive Politics code, uh, codes campaign contributions by uh, their own homegrown taxonomy of all the things that an organization can do. So um, they, you know, they show up uh, in, in, on our site under the uh, industries listing and you can get an idea of um, how general these are, uh, how general or specific these are by looking at those. Lawyers and law firms, always at the top of the list. Uh, securities, investment, public sector unions, real estate, et cetera, et cetera. So um, for any one of these, uh, we can look, we can get some aggregate facts. Um, there are two types in all of the aggregate lookups. One is just a top 10 for uh, that type of entity. So if we wanted to look at the top 10 politicians who received money in, in the 2012 cycle, we'd go to the aggregates, Paul's top blank dot JSON endpoint and uh, get this result where we'd see Romney, Obama, Walker, Brown, Cuomo, Elizabeth Warren, so some pretty familiar names. This is, this is the top ten of that list. Um, I should note that um, it, some would be quick to point out that uh, Obama raised more money than Romney did. These, are, these aggregates are working on the uh, itemized uh, contributions that are released by uh, the FEC and, um, and cleaned by the Center for Responsive Politics. They do not, in, they do not for that reason, include uh, donations of under $200, which are uh, bundled together and, and, and reported separately. So um, that's why you may see some inconsistencies with what you might expect in those titles, in those totals, sorry. Uh, for all of the other ones in this, uh, in this category, you can start from some entity and see uh, top, uh, um, top uh, 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 contributors uh, to that entity. So let's say the top industries to Barack Obama. Uh, here we go. I, let's pretend uh, for, to save some time that I did an entity lookup and found Barack Obama, got his uh, his um, Influence Explorer ID and uh, then searched, I would get the top 10 uh, industries that contributed to Barack Obama. Um, so retired folks, uh, lawyers and law firms, education, health professionals, business services, civil servants, et cetera. And, and the total count of contributions for each one and the total amount of those contributions. Uh, Similar for the other organizations, I don't want to take up all the time here today, um, um, there you can get the top 10 for each type or you can get um, some breakdowns and top 10 lists uh, for each, uh, for each um, entity uh, in that bucket. Um, the, um, so finally, uh, the last thing I wanted to mention was that we also have, uh, sorry, an itemized uh, contribution list. If you're familiar with data.influenceexplorer.com, this, uh, this site provides um, some slices of the bulk data that we offer. So if you want to know about all of the contributions in the 2012 cycle, you can uh, download, you can go to this site and download uh, all of that information. In most cases, you're not interested in that kind of fire hose level type thing. So data.ie lets you uh, um, uh, filter by things like state. And it's a very powerful tool. It can do a lot of the things that most people want to do, but there's always some edge cases, there's always some extra things you might want to do. Uh, the good news is that data.influenceexplorer.com uses the same API that's available to you. So you can start from, uh, so let's say we wanted to look at campaign contributions. Uh, we have all of these different arguments that we can submit to it. So maybe we uh, only want to know uh, maybe we want to look for, um, uh, 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 let's say, um, things where the recipient state was New Jersey and the contributor state was Pennsylvania. Um, and the amount was greater than $10,000. Uh, we can get a response to that, which will be um, an enormous response. Uh, and this is in JSON but we could, set, we could send that same request uh, 
uh, and all requests to Influence Explorer by changing the, the, the JSON part of the URL to e either CSV or XLS, you can get those uh, types of formats. I'm getting the wrap-up sign. So uh, if, if you have any more questions while you're using this, uh, uh, please uh, don't hesitate to contact me or anybody else on the team uh, for your specific uh, use cases. As people can see before we move on, we're going to be running a little late because uh, as you can see, most of our APIs um, could be whole webinars unto themselves. Um, so we did have a schedule until 5 p.m. It's probably going to go about 15 minutes over. So please stay on the call onto the webcast if you can join us. It will be archived if you have to step off a little early. That's okay. Um, during any of this, if you have questions, please use the chat feature uh, to ask questions of our developers. Um, we are also really keen on helping you out if you're looking to have a training, a one-on-one -on -one tutorial, or want to know how to use the data services we provide um, for your own research, for your own reporting, let us know. Get in contact with us. We'll be sharing our contact information at the end of the call. I'm going to turn it over um, to something that also works hand in hand with Influence Explorer, and that is Docket Wrench. And uh, Andrew, take it away. Cool. Um, let me just turn on my screen sharing here. Awesome. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit today about our Docket Wrench site, uh, as well as the API uh, that powers it. So Docket Wrench is uh, one of the newer data offerings of Sunlight, uh, and it's a tool that we built to help make sense of the comments that are submitted by uh, companies and members of the public uh, on proposed and final uh, federal regulations. So. Uh, we've been we've done analysis of other kinds of government influence um, as we show on Influence Explorer for a long time, um, but uh, this was sort of our, our first foray into working with data on the uh, executive branch side, uh, and it's a lot fuzzier than the data that, that um, that's on uh, Influence Explorer. It's not so much numbers, but more text. Um, so we have um, we uh, use some other kinds of uh, analytical techniques to help make sense of of some of this data, um, with a particular emphasis on uh, finding situations where companies are participating in the process or where um, organizations are organizing letter writing campaigns um, with form letters and that sort of thing. Um, DocuWrench uh, itself, much like Influence Explorer, um, is a consumer of its own API. So everything that you can see on the DocuWrench website, uh, you can also access via the API. So I will start off. Um, just doing a search here for the term Obamacare. This is a pretty populated search. Um, so you can see that, that, that we do various kinds of searches. Um, you can search over dockets, which are groups of comments and rulemaking documents. Um, you can also uh, search over rules. The, um, Obamacare being a slang term doesn't show up in the rules themselves um, so much as it does in the comments. Um, you can also see individual comments um, and then um, organizations that might have participated in the process as well as agencies. Um, so I'm going to pick a docket here um, that uses this term. Um, so this is a docket from the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Um, and so we have some basic metadata about um, the docket here, um, a timeline of, of uh, when there were submissions on it, um, information about the main a rule is a proposed rule in this docket, how many comments run, and so forth. Uh, and then one um, area of particular interest where I think I'm going to spend um, most of my time talking about the API is this clustering functionality. Uh, so what this is is a tool that groups together similar comments, uh, particularly um, some of the healthcare related comments. We get a lot of people submitting form letter comments, so it will be the same comment submitted by lots of people. Um, so this tool. Uh, lets you explore that. So uh, what we see here in this top area is groups of comments where each comment is at least 50% similar to some other comment in, in the group. Um, and you can kind of conceptualize the way this is organized as, as, as a sort of tree. So you end up with groups where everything is 50% similar, but maybe that's too fuzzy. Um, if we look at, at, at this first group here, um, a lot of these comments the entire text of the comment is just C attached and there's some paper attachment or something. Um, so you can ratchet that down and, and um, say, well, maybe I, um, I want to restrict it to comments that are 60% similar rather than 50% similar, um, which causes this one group of comments to break up into a bunch of little groups of comments um, with that higher threshold. So here, if you look at it, um, here's a, a comment here, and the highlighting text um, is indicating how common 
the text in the comment is uh, within that grouping. So, so this comment actually has some, some substantive text here that's shared with other comments in this group. So um, Paul Peterson submitted this comment. Uh, Clay Wallace submitted another comment with exactly the same text. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn over to, uh, to the API here uh, and show how you would uh, explore some of this data. Uh, so uh, we're going to use the same API Explorer that other people have been showing. Um, and I'm going to enter my API key. Um, so I will start off with some, some general metadata um, calls here. So, oops. Oh, oh that's my fault. Uh, Just make sure. Sorry about that. Um, why does that back? Yeah, cool. Um, so I'm going to start off looking at some, some general metadata here. Um, so you can get information uh, about the whole agency that I was looking at, which is CMS, um, using that um, agency ID there. Um, so this is going to give me just general statistics about um, top submitters to this agency, how many documents have, um, have been submitted, um, the breakdown of, of um, how many of the documents are comments versus rules versus other kinds of content. Um, the uh, date range of submissions over time, and just other um, stats that are that that make up the general agency overview page. Uh, going down one level to the actual docket that we were looking at, there's a similar metadata mechanism for the docket. Let's um, look at the docket here. So this is going to be similar. Uh, again, we're going to get. Um, what agency it's from, how many documents are in are in it, and then um, stats over time and so forth. But really what I want to focus on, because I think it's the least self-explanatory and sort of the hardest to understand, are the um, API components that, that, that power that data clustering view. Um, so that's this uh, clustering hierarchy uh, call. So there's some, some explanatory information here um, that I would encourage you to dig into that I'm not going <laughs> to cover right now. Um, but if we enter in the docket ID, um, we should get some summary information about that this tree structure. Um, so you can see general information about um, how many documents were in clusters versus not, what agency it was in, and so forth. Uh, and then here's the actual clustering hierarchy. So it's expressed um, as a list of groups. So, the, so this first list um, is going to be the groups that are at the 50% level. That's this cutoff number here. Um, there's going to be an ID that's the um, ID for this cluster within our clustering system. Um, and then it's children. So the children are going to be a similar list, um, except each entry is going to be at the 60% cutoff level um, instead, of, instead of the 50% level, um, and so on and so forth down. So you can see that the same tree structure that we visualized uh, is expressed in full form um, internally here in this data structure. Uh, so if we were to pick a, a particular cluster and cutoff point, we could get even more information. So I'm going to take this document here, uh, or, or, or rather this cluster, which has an ID of 1504 and a cutoff of 0.8. Um, and let's actually see all the documents that are in that list. So that's the same docket ID here. Uh, the cluster ID was 1504. And the cutoff, we're looking at 0.8. I try it. That's going to get me a list of all the documents. So that's um, that's the equivalent to this listing here on the left-hand side in the pane. Um, so so here's the ID of each document um, and who submitted it. Then um, if there was one particular document that we wanted to see and we wanted to get the text of it annotated um, according to which text was shared versus not, um, we can move on to this next call, uh, which again takes a docket ID and a cluster ID, which is 1504, um, and a document ID, which let's let's pick this this document here, which is uh, document 1562. And again, the cutoff that we're talking about is 0.8. I'm going to try it. Um, so this actually shows us the the, the text. Um, and if you're familiar with HTML, um, this text has been um, altered so that um, we have tags in here that highlight it by, um, by the, the, the color scheme um, that's shown here. So I, I can show up a better example document that, that uh, might demonstrate that behavior here. Um, let's see, let's do the last one. Um, maybe a different example. 
people. Um, so uh, I'm not finding a great example um, just now. Um, but what this, this functionality basically lets you do um, is you can see uh, which parts of a comment um, have been modified by the submitter. Um, so he, so um, here's an example where some of this text is shared from the form letter, but this person has added a sentence of their own. Um, so you can access that um, highlighted text through, uh, through the API. Um, a last interesting feature here are the uh, distinguishing phrases uh, that, are, um, that accompany each comment group. Um, and those are also uh, there in the API response. Um, and these are just phrases that, are, that occur very frequently in the cluster that you're looking at, but not very frequently um, in the rest of the, of the docket. Um, so this would be a good starting place um, if you were trying to figure out who organized a particular letter writing campaign. Um, you could take these phrases and type them into Google and see um, oftentimes you'll, you'll end up landing on um, a page that's, that was written by the organization that, um, that organized the campaign. Um, and because all of this data is available via the API, you could even automate this process um, if you were so inclined. Um, so that's uh, a look at the, uh, the, the clustering infrastructure. Um, the Docker Wrench API certainly um, also makes available all of the um, information that, that's shown on the company pages, agency pages, docket pages, and so forth, um, as well as the full suite of um, search endpoints. Um, that, uh, that power the, the document search. Uh, and if you are comfortable uh, with the, some of the developer tools in your web browser, uh, you can actually turn on uh, the, the web developer console uh, and then navigate around the document site and actually watch it make API calls in real time so you can see what API calls it's making um, and um, tweak them and figure out for yourself uh, what all is going on. As other developers have talked about, uh, certainly feel free to contact me or anyone on the team if you have any questions about this tool. Um, and I think I'll hand it off to the next person. Yeah. Thanks so much, uh, Andrew. We're going to turn it over to Jacob Fenton. Uh, he's an editorial engineer with the Sunlight Foundation Reporting Group, and he's going to walk through um, our political party time API. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, let me just turn on my desktop sharing, uh, and I think that goes. Uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, political party time uh, compared to some of these other sites. It's, it's a lot simpler. It's a lot easier to understand. Um, and what we're trying to do with political party time is pretty simple. Um, there are all these sources of public data that tell us who's giving money to who, who's commenting on what, what bills are. Um, there's almost nothing in public on who are who's holding private fundraisers, um, and we think that's uh, when the site was first set up years ago, we thought that was a real uh, mis important missing piece. Um, and we think that there's really important business that takes place basically off the record um, at these fundraisers. Um, so the, the API, the base for the API is the site, uh, which I'm, I'm looking at right now. Um, and uh, I, should, I should first say that this is aimed generally at federal candidates. Um, so we'll see people who are in office or people who are running for office. Ever so often we do include um, local local races, um, but secondly, these are fundraiser fundraising invitations that we get uh, typically from from lobbyists um, and from sources that we have. Um, more recently, we've started just entering. Um, uh, we, we sort of have placeholders for important fundraisers that we read about, um, and I should say we we get invitations ahead of the time sometimes, and sometimes we don't get them until months later. So we'll put in a placeholder for an important uh, fundraiser that we read about in the news, and then. Sometimes we won't get the invitation until later. If you are somebody who's getting these invitations, please uh, send them to us. Uh, we're, we're always looking to broaden our collection. So um, we show uh, uh, things that are upcoming, things that have already happened. I'm just going to show you what, what upcoming uh, events look like. You can also sign up for, for an alert or for uh, some sort of RSS feed if you want to know about um, these things happening. Um, looking at the upcoming events, there's really, there's really sort of two kinds of events. I mean, some of these have 40 or 50 different sponsors. Um, some of them have none at all. Um, all those sponsors are, or, or hosts rather, are people who um, ha are giving a ton of money um, uh, to, to host this. Um, just to show you what one of these actually looks like, um, here is an invitation uh, for Rosa Delora. Um, it, it says very clearly all the names of the committees that she serves on, um, just in case you happen to have business before those committees. Um, See, so here's, here's another one. Uh, I think I jogged past this guy's house once. Um, it, it's sort of amazing. I just Google. I, I, I sometimes will just Google the names of these hosts. Sometimes they're people you've heard of. Sometimes 
they're, they're, they're someone you've never heard of, but it's always amazing what, what influence they have. Um, so to use the API, I'm going to start out at this sort of main um, API site and just navigate down to uh, the part that says political party time API. Uh, I'm going to click on the trip, try the API uh, link. Uh, I think I've already got it running here. Um, and I'm going to use the same API credentials as everyone else has been using. Um, the point of this API is really much simpler. We're just going to try to get some, some of the parties that are in our database. Um, there are some other calls, but mostly the name of the game here is just finding out what are the events that are happening. Um, you can get a sense of what's available pretty easily. Um, I, I often just look for recent stuff. This is a search for uh, parties after November 1st of this year for someone from Iowa. We have exactly one event. Um, I think it is for Terry Brandstadt, who's running for governor. It's a local race, but we have it in there because someone thinks it's important. Um, we also have um, a lot of other information here. We have whether it's canceled. Uh, we have sort of the, the, the make, make checks payable to address. Um, we, we also have the venue. For every venue, there's also a unique ID. Uh, we track those. I should say we track these imperfectly. We have humans entering this data, and that sometimes these private, private fundraisers are held at people's houses and whatnot. Um, so it's not, a, it's not an exact science. Um, but um, there's, there's also the, 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 the theory here is to make it useful to people who are actually uh, covering stuff you know, maybe in a particular part of the, part of the country. Uh, so, so this one's at the Iowa. Um, if you know the CRP ID, so that's the uh, Open Secrets ID, or the Center for Responsive Politics ID, you could enter it and, and cover stuff uh, and, and uh, find stuff using that ID. I think you can get the CRP ID from uh, the Influence Explorer API that Bob uh, showed just a minute ago. Um, we also have a host ID. Um, the host ID is an internal ID of the, the host. Um, you're not going to, there's really no way you're going to have of knowing that um, unless you happen to go in and use another one of the calls. We have a call uh, that will return hosts. So um, if, you, if you're interested in researching this, you can pretty much um, just uh, call hosts uh, with no arguments at all, and you're just going to get, um, what, I think all 12,000 of them. Um, and if you're writing some sort of machine, uh, a robot, you can just run through all those and gather all the hosts. Um, or you can sort of uh, follow links uh, from, from previous fundraisers that um, uh, you've, you've encountered. Um, that's pretty much the whole thing, uh, the, the whole party time API. Um, it's not that much more complicated than that. Um, th that's right. We also have methods for for benefiting a given lawmaker based on their CRP ID. Um, I know we're running way behind, so I'm going to turn it over to James at this point, but uh, please uh, hit me up afterwards with questions if you have any. that over. Um, I'm going to do I'm the last one here. So I'm doing the Open States API, uh, which is of all the APIs that we've talked about today, it's the only API that's not really dealing with federal information. This is dealing with um, information coming out of state legislatures. Um, this is all the information that um, is available on openstates.org um, and also powers our mobile apps and also Scout, if that's a tool that you see. Um, I'm going to share. All right. Um, so, yep, there we go. So Open States is uh, a site that looks like this. Um, what we do is we aggregate information from all 50 state legislatures, also D.C. and Puerto Rico's governments. And basically it's the, all the information coming out of the legislature. So the bills, the votes, the APIs, the committees. Um, this is what the site looks like and just to kind of get you an idea of what kind of data we have available. Um, all of the data that we have is available via an API and also both downloads. So just like all the other ones, I've gone to this page um, and you can find the Try the API link and the documentation link there. Um, Open States basically operates on the principle that there are six major data types. Um, there's metadata, which um, I'll come back to. That's kind of uh, data that's describing all the information we have about the state. Um, bills legislators, committees, events, and districts. Uh, and these types are, each one has a search and a lookup method, so it's relatively simple. I'm not going to go into each of them. It works a lot like the Congress API that was demoed earlier. 
Uh, so if you're already using that or if you've if you were paying attention during that part, you've seen a lot of the similar stuff. So these are the docs for the Open States API. Um, it kind of also lists these basic data types and explains how to access each of them. Um, like I said, each has a search endpoint, which basically for each of the different fields that's available in that data type, you can get you can search by any attribute that we have, which I'll come back to in a second. Or when you get an individual, if you're looking for an individual piece of metadata for a state, an individual bill, an individual legislature, legislator, um, or anything like that, you can do individual lookups. Um, and they all work pretty much the same, so I'm just going to go ahead and demo some of the common ones. The first one to talk about is metadata. Metadata is usually where you start. This is um, an example call for just getting North Carolina's metadata. There's one piece of metadata per state. As you can see, the calling format is just openstates.org slash API v1 metadata and then the um, postal code for the state. And you add your API key in there um, as you do with all the other APIs. This is what you get back. It basically tells you all the information we have, so how many chambers the state has, um, what features are available, which are just some extra features. So subjects means that we categorize the state bills by what subject they have. Influence Explorer means that we have links to the Influence Explorer IDs, which we now actually have in all states. Um, so the Influence uh, Explorer API, that was demoed by Bob earlier. If you're trying to get um, state, pol or state politics information and also state finance information, you can link between the two APIs. It also just has kind of general information on when things were last updated, if you're wondering about the freshness. In general, though, that'll be in the last 24 hours that we scraped, and also um, monthly dumps um, of all of the data that, are av that is available. And so down here we also have all the session details, so 2009, 2011. North Carolina basically just has odd number sessions. And now we'll go to actually looking at um, bill search. So this is a bill search. Um, if you look at the URL here, it's just um, like all the other entity types in the Open States API. You just do API v1 slash the name of the entity type. So here is slash bills, and then you can filtered by all the different attributes. And for some of these types, um, there are 20 plus attributes, so I'm just going to stick to kind of the basic ones. So here what we're doing is we're doing a Q equals snow, which is just a full text search of all the bills that mention the word snow. And then we're limiting the state to Alaska, and we have our API key in here, um, which you would substitute with your own. And then this gives back just a short list, um, not the full details of each bill, but just kind of a summary of each bill. Um, it would appear to be six or seven here maybe a few more, and so you'll get the title of each bill, when it was created in our system, the last time we detected an update on the source site, um, you'll get the bill ID, whatever subject it's under, um, what chamber it came from, and then you get these, this long bill ID which comes from our system. And this is just kind of the basics of a bill. This doesn't have all the votes and all the sponsors and things like that. If you actually wanted to do that, you construct an individual bill detail query, which is, this is kind of the pattern. A lot like how Bob earlier was talking about how you would do a lookup to get the details on the entity types and then you'd go deeper. So once you found a bill that you wanted more information on, you would do a lookup that looks something like, I think I actually have it back and try it. Um, so you could do something like um, North Carolina 2013. Um, SR1, I'm encoding the space there because the triad tool doesn't do that automatically, it seems. And then you would get back all the information about the bill. Um, and you'll notice that this has in each individual action, so if you're looking through this data, you can see when the bill was filed, you can see when the bill was adopted. So this is SR1 from this year in North Carolina, you can see it was a relatively simple resolution. You can get the sources that we use, this is the actual link to the state of North Carolina's website that we use to collect this information. Um, you can see each vote that happened on it. So here we see all the legislators that voted. Um, you can see their, we have both their ID and the name as it appears in the site. So Wade, which we've linked to a legislator in our system that we've given this ID. Um, each individual vote, as you can see there's a lot of data here. Some bills are going to have 20, 30 votes. This one's relatively short. The subjects that the state categorized it under. Um, the sponsors for the bill, which again, we've we both have their full name as it appears on the website, and we have the legislator's ID in our system. Uh, these legislator IDs in our system are going to come in handy later, which is why I'm pointing them out. So I'll grab one for now uh, for Andrew C. Brock. We'll come back to that. Basically, just all this data, um, different states have different amounts of data. There's kind of a common subset. All this is documented in detail on the Open States documentation page, but you can dive in and 
some states have a lot more data and some states have kind of a minimal subset. It really depends on what the individual states make available. So then we'll come back and we will do, um, this is a legislator lookup. Uh, this is a lot like the bill lookup, but here what we're actually doing is we're looking it up by geography. So I've given a latitude and longitude, um, which you could get from another API, or if you're on a mobile device, you could get it from the device itself. And we've, we've asked for all the legislators that represent um, that individual thing. So this happens to be in North Carolina and, as well, and so this will give us back the full detail on the two legislators that support that area. Um, in some states, you might have more than two representatives, and in a place like D.C. or Nebraska, you would only have one. Um, but however many legislators currently represent that area, you'll get, you'll get their full name, you'll get their boundary, um, you'll get their email address if we have it, off their phone number if they have it, all the committees that they're on, basically every piece of information that we can make available. Uh, and again, just like everywhere else, we have sources linking back. This is the basic pattern for the Open States API. Since we're running a little long, I won't go into more entity types. Um, basically, you'll usually start with a search on either a committee, a bill, or a uh, person, and then from there you can dive in and get more types using these IDs. So when you have one of these IDs, you can just put it in here um, just after the uh, legislators thing. Oops, I did that wrong. Ah, uh, that's committee ID. Uh, all right, and so now we'll get this person. This is actually a resigned legislator. This is Ty Harrell, who apparently resigned uh, back in 2009, but we still have all the information available. Um, and as you can see down here, we have the transparency data ID. So if you're linking over transparency data to get their um, the campaign contributions and things like that, those are all there. Um, committees work pretty much the same way, so I won't go into demoing them. Basically, it's the same idea. You can search by all the different attributes of the committee, the name, what state it's in, all of those things. And then you can use the committee ID to get every member of it and anything else that you need to get. Um, and again, if you have more questions, um, feel free to get at us. We have an Open States Google group that's linked from openstates.org. And we also, um, are, you can contact us via the normal uh, Sunlight email. I'm sure it's linked to that other page somewhere as well. <laughs> Thanks, James. I wanted to uh, just finish, wrap it up for those who, can, who are still with us on the call. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to press star seven to unmute your phone if you want to uh, ask us over the phone. Uh, I also shared via the chat feature uh, contact information for all our developers who uh, graciously, graciously and took time to walk us through um, some pretty hefty stuff. As you can see, the six APIs the Sunlight Foundation has are really robust have a lot of information, um, can do many different types of queries, and some of them also have bulk data features, which we also didn't really get into. Um, but we really, there's countless uses for these. Um, you can, whether you are a newbie to coding or really are trying to build an app um, or a site for your own use or for your reporting, there's a lot we, we have, a lot we can help out with. Um, I encourage everyone on the call to not only registering for an API key, um, but also joining our Sunlight Labs Google group. Um, all of our labs team is on it, um, so feel free. You can easy way to email us, ask a question, also get help from the bigger community. Uh, we do have various hackathons and developer events over the years, so by staying in touch with Sunlight Foundation, uh, you can come see us, hang out with us. We're at conferences throughout the year, um, but really wanted just to uh, let, we'll stay on the line for a few more minutes if anyone has questions can ask them over chat. Uh, my contact information is also on the screen in front of you, Liz at sunlightfoundation.com. I'm really happy to, um, to um, you know, put, get, get working in the newsroom. Always like to do media partnerships and work it through. Uh, we got a question over the chat line um, from Chris at KPCC in, in California. Hello, Chris. Uh, and he asked if we have any tips on steps we can take to cache or store API calls we don't hit the API too much. I'm going to leave that up to our developers on the other side of the table. Um, so a lot of these APIs have bulk data available. So if you're using a ton of the data, um, I think the majority of these APIs have bulk data available. So if you go to the API page, you should be able to find the bulk data for any of them. Um, for OpenStates, for example, it's openstates.org slash downloads. Um, so if you're 
planning on using a lot, um, that's one thing. Also, just let us know what you consider um, too much. Um, most of these, as you've seen, we've done, I think, 1.2 billion calls. So we, we do handle a lot of traffic. So sometimes um, we can handle maybe more than you'd expect. But let us know what you're planning on doing, and we can make sure that we can handle the capacity uh, in general. And also, we don't have restrictions on people on any of the APIs storing the data, on um, caching on their servers. Oh. So as long as, so feel free to just. Unless you break it. <laughs> uh, and so, yeah, it use, as, yeah <laughs> use as much as you want, and feel free to you know store it in your database locally, um, whatever it is that you're using. Um, and yeah, if you're, if you're just kind of trying to grab everything, I, I saw he said, uh, you just want to be respectful and kind with the calls, um, that's great. Just, you know, put some decent weights in there and or let us know what you're doing. We can maybe point you towards both downloads if you're worried about the use that you're going to be doing. And one thing, once you have an API key, sorry, we have a microphone here. We're trying to record this for all of our archives. Once you have an API key, you can join, when you go to sunlightfoundations.com slash APIs, we do keep track of all the calls we make. So. As you can see, it's been, we've been doing this for the past few years and um, can handle a heavy, heavy stream of calls coming in, um, which is why it's so great. It's over 1.1 billion served. Yeah, the, the reason that we request that you get an API key is mainly so we can get in contact with you in case there's ever any problems. Uh, you shouldn't have any worry that we are going to contact you in the future about limiting your use or you know, charging you or anything like that. That'll be pretty useful. So there's another question from Andrew who asked, what are the basic coding skills necessary to start exploring? And honestly, Andrew, I am also not a developer. <laughs> and um, I would uh, say the best. HTTP. <laughs> uh, if you go to codecademy.com and scroll down to the very bottom of their page, there's a little link that says APIs. Uh, they have done a great job of providing basic HTTP REST API introduction courses for most programming languages. So if you know any one of JavaScript, Python, Ruby, uh, that could get you started pretty quick. And then we have a lesson that's devoted to our Capital Words API uh, for each of those three languages. Right, and I will also say that even before that step, that you can go ahead as uh, so many of the developers here on the call did, just go into try it into the query builder, sign up for a key, and you can start putting parameters in there. You can't break it. Don't worry, I've tried, and it doesn't break. Um, so it's, and I would say that's the best way to do it. Start putting in things that, and you know, work from the front end tool first because that's obviously the friendly user interface uh, way of accessing that data. And once, you know, especially in Capital Words, for instance, you're seeing that there's lots of results, you're not finding the right ones you're looking for, you want summary data, then I would go ahead and use the Try It, uh, the Query Builder um, in the API page, and then just start messing around from there. And I think sort of what Bob had up and what Andrew was discussing in terms of using developer's uh, tool within your browser, I would say if you can open up two browser windows or have two windows side by side, a lot of times, I'm not a coder, this is Liz talking, I'm not a developer, but using that try it feature and trying to compare it to the query you might be doing through the front end of the site is a really great way to sort of see how um, our developers and our engineers built these sites using our APIs. To be clear, too, that um, a a as you use the Try It tool, it's going to show you the request that you made, and that's the end of an HTTP call. You really don't have to do any programming to interact with most of the, maybe all the APIs, but you can enter that address into your browser's, uh, uh, you know, into your browser's uh, uh, address bar, just like any other website, and get back all of the results. Uh, in the case of IE, and maybe a few others, uh, changing the end of the request from JSON to CSV or XLS might get you something that, you know, if you're, if you're working in R, say, or something, and, and, you know, you want that CSV, and after then you can take it and run, run with it, that's really all you need to know. You could even open it in Excel. Right, yeah. No one will judge you. You're just going to add the, 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 the address that the, that the Try It uh, interface gives you. Um, you can, uh, you just need to add your API key as an extra argument onto that, and uh, you'll be fine. The alternative formats are handled by different APIs in different ways, but for each API, the format, how you signal which format you want is clearly specified in the documentation. Yeah, oh, uh, I was just going to add, um, you typically can get a CSV of all of the data, and so 
you don't need to program at all in order to grab a CSV of everything and put that in a spreadsheet or a database manager or something. Um, but sometimes it's easier to just download everything and then look for the 200 rows you're interested in. <laughs> right. And if that fails, call up Liz or one of us. <laughs> Well, with that, um, I think that was some good questions. Again, uh, feel free to contact us via email, um, contact us on Google Groups, or visit sunlightfoundation.com. Not only can you easily find our API community within the top navigation bar, but you uh, can see all the latest um, real-time investigations, uh, new tools, lots of projects, um, and the research we're doing here at Sunlight um, to you know, spread the word about the work we're doing, uh, looking at open government transparency and making our governments more accountable, also where we are in the news. So hopefully this was really helpful. I thank everyone for taking time this afternoon um, to getting to know the six APIs, the Sunlight Foundation, a little better. Uh, we are archiving this webinar, both the audio and all everything you have seen on your computer screens. It will be archived at Sunlight Academy. That is training. Dot sunlightfoundation.com. So look for that in a few in the coming in the coming days. Um, we'll also be sending an email out to all participants, um, and everything is free. So the archive is free. All future events. Um, hopefully, we'll see you guys uh, again in the future. Thanks so much. <laughs>